Hey, Miles. Yeah, Cam? Have you ever heard of Whiplash? Yeah, didn't you get that when you got in that accident last month? Uh, different kind of Whiplash. Welcome back to Inconceivable Media. I'm Cam. And I'm Miles. And this week we watched Whiplash, the 2014 film brought to us by Damien Chazelle, starring Miles Teller, J.K. Simmons, and supporting roles from Melissa Benoist and Paul Reiser. I just want to note that I am not in this movie. (laughs) Ha 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 ha. Different Miles. (laughs) Spells way different. Ahem. So this story follows an... uh, I'm just going to go with what it said on Wikipedia because it's a pretty good summary. The story follows ambitious jazz drummer Andrew Neiman, played by Miles Teller, who is pushed to his limit by his abusive and ruthlessly strict band leader, played by J.K. Simmons, at the fictional Schaefer Conservatory, which takes place in New York City. All right, so, Miles, what did you think about this film? Well, I have plenty of opinions. Uh, opinions are good. Opinions yes. are good. But uh, did you did you like it? <laughs> Let's start there. Um, I'm gonna have to say no and yes in that mm-hmm. order. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a very complicated relationship with jazz music. Uh, so I like jazz. I like original jazz. I don't like the newer stuff. And uh, this movie is basically showing why. I don't like new modern day jazz. Oh, okay. I feel like there's a bit of stuff that we can dive into a little bit once we get to our next section. Okay, so in a way, it's kind of bringing up some bad blood, some bad memories. And so you don't like it when that happens? Or do you like it when that happens? The masochist in me says I do, but... (laughs) The pessimist in me doesn't, I guess you could say. Uh, okay. Somebody along those lines. All right. So Personally, then... uh, like I said, jazz is a very complex subject for me because um, I actually ended up basically dropping performing music because of it. Oh, wow. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, right. it's, it's a very touchy subject. As far as the movie goes and the people in it, uh, mm-hmm. JK did an amazing job of being a person that you can despise. Uh, personally, I quite liked him in Thank You for Smoking. I thought he was an awesome character in there, and he hasn't changed who he was that much. But uh, in here, I absolutely loathe him, which means I respect him so much as an actor because he can be that person I despise as well as that person that I actually kind of like. Yeah, I have. Uh, I I absolutely agree. It's you know, it's it's one thing when a, an actor does such a good job at being a despicable person, a great villain, that you just think, wow, you're an amazing actor. But what really sucks sometimes is that then people think that they're a horrible person in real life and they can't separate the actor from the role because that happens so many times. And it's really... It always seems to happen to the people that are villains too. They, they're, they're a really good villain and then they're just vilified... In public. Didn't that happen with the guy who played in... um, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, yeah. Yeah. The the, the actor who was um, Joffrey, King Joffrey, is... I don't necessarily know if he is a sweetheart, per se, in person, but he is absolutely not the sociopath that his character was in Game of Thrones. And I don't... I mean, it's been a few years since um, his character was killed off. Um, but I don't know if, and I know he took a break from acting because everyone just seemed to kind of hate him. Like he would go to cons and stuff like that and people would boo him and things like that, which is, that's mean. That's, that's really that inappropriate. That speaks a lot about the fandom too. Well, yes. That you is. can't separate the actors yeah, from the characters. Yeah, I know. And, 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 you know, he got like all sorts of awful hate mail and stuff like that just because of a fictional character. That he portrayed extremely well. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's awesome that he did that so well. It's 
terrible though that that's what ended up happening to him that he basically was just like i don't want to act anymore or at least he didn't want anything high profile because he didn't want to continue having that kind of a spotlight and i mean honestly good on him for making that choice because i mean you got to do what you got to do to stay healthy yes. something that i don't really think happens in this movie but again that's something else that we can get into later but other people in the movie as well miles teller i also thought did a really good job with this um mm-hmm. he really like when i first saw him and that and i was kind of looking and i'm or kind of watching the movie the first thing that came to my head was shia labeouf <laughs> i feel and i was like, like is this shia labeouf He's and you're like, like, no, this is Miles Teller. I'm like, okay, he kind of looks like Trudeau with the profile of his face in the lighting that they did in there. <laughs> he's like the 2010s. He's like the new decade version of Shia LaBeouf in a way. Yeah. I mean, I feel kind of bad for Similar Shia roles well. and, and what? Well, I mean, Shia LaBeouf is like, I think getting, I think he's like in his mid thirties or approaching he's 40, our age. I think now. Yeah. He's our age. Well, I'm pretty sure he's older than us. Oh yeah. Well, he's but, right around our age. Yeah. Whereas Miles Teller is... Oh, I guess he's more my age than your age. You're younger than... Well, you're only a year younger than me, so... <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no. So, uh, yeah, he did a great job in the movie, too. Uh, mm-hmm. ah, I'd say everybody did well. Uh, so... Would I recommend this to other people? Y- yeah, um, absolutely. I'm going to have to say no, but not because it's a bad movie. I think it is a decent movie. I think it's a good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just have... It's more of a me thing than a you thing. Sorry, Whiplash. <laughs> that's that's. Fine. This is my breakup with you. It's a me thing. It's not a you thing. <laughs> I feel that this this is a movie that I kind of want to recommend to people, but perhaps not for the right reasons. I'm a musician, so this movie speaks to me on a level that probably doesn't speak to everybody, and. I don't really like a whole lot of music movies because I feel that they ring hollow a whole lot. But this one didn't, despite the fact that it kind of follows the same beats that a lot of other band and music movies do. Um, I think that has more to do with the fact that the characters as they're presented are people that I have met and worked with in real life. And some of the resolutions to things are also things that I have somewhat experienced in a way. So I sit there and I'm like, yeah, this feels real. Okay, so... That's not necessarily a great thing, but it feels real. So then I I have a couple questions for you because there are a couple of big uh, music movies that follow very similar everything this movie is. Oh, not not very similar. Uh, Like, it's it's a fictionalized world with a real setting Mm -hmm. and uh, i'm gonna shout these out to you off quickly Mm -hmm. we'll say yay nay maybe give like a little bit about it first one this is spinal tap yay you liked it It oh yes absolutely that's a classic that thing you do uh yay i mm, kind of on the it's like kind of thumb is sort of going up but still kind of (laughs) struck in the middle Fair enough. We might have to explore that one then because uh, I I love those two movies. Uh, This is Spinal Tap is one of my favorites, especially when they have the the little people dancing around the statue. Oh, so good. I think it was on a band trip or something like on the bus that I got to see that thing you do. (laughs) And I liked it at the time. And I'm pretty sure. But although. So here's the thing about it. This is Spinal Tap. I've seen a bunch of times and I have spoken about it with a whole lot of other people so it's very fresh in my memory that thing you do i saw it one time i liked it and i think i've only maybe seen bits and pieces of it on tv since then so it's been 15 years since i've gone back to like revisit it so i remember a positive experience with it but that's about it Fair enough. Yeah, maybe we'll watch that one again. Something maybe do it like a short. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We'll do that one with a uh, Spinal Tap or something, <laughs> just to you know, water wash everything down and keep our taste buds good. Do you have any other ones to throw at me? Those are the two main ones that I was thinking about. Okay, uh, there are other ones. Uh, I could throw a uh, Spice World at you, but uh, I haven't seen it actually. I oh, don't, it's aren't there two Spice Girl movies? Yes. Yeah, I've seen neither of them. Uh, let's try to keep it that way. Um, <laughs> Okay. Right. I'm not a big fan of them, personally. <laughs> but then again, I'm not a... 
I'm not a humongous fan of pop, especially that era of pop. Like some of the songs are okay, and I listen to them for some of the nostalgia, but most of them just they don't they don't brush me the right so way. So you're telling me if I start going, yo, I'll tell you what I want, what I really really want. You're not. Oh, oh no, you're not. No, okay, I'm. I'm gonna look at you and say <laughs> you want to stop now. Okay. Yep. <laughs> We're stopping that right now. Uh, kind of going back to you recommending it. Does the fact that Fletcher has got to have like the dirtiest mouth as far as Hollywood movies go, does that maybe make it another barrier for you to want to recommend it to other people? Absolutely not. Okay. Actually, to tell you the truth, uh, Fletcher matched my music teacher that ruined music for me damn near perfectly. Really? Bald, uh, bad mouth, very uh, punctual about things. And this is a high school music group. Whoa. Okay, I mean, I think we're just gonna have to get into the spoilers now because we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get into this. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I've never heard this from you. This is this is uncharted waters for me. Okay, everyone, <laughs> uh, we're gonna, yep, you know, we'll take a break here. Uh, if you haven't seen this, it is on Amazon Prime in Canada. Might be available on other places to watch around the world, but uh, go and try and see if you can uh, watch this. Here's our plug and play for NordVPN. Please sponsor us. <laughs> Or, you know, watch clips on YouTube, especially uh, that that'll, that'll tell you everything you need to know about I, the character of Fletcher. I'm sure we, I'm sure there's <laughs> some sort of uh, like wisecrack video on this. <laughs> oh, no doubt about it. Uh, until then, enjoy Whiplash. Like Whiplash, Caravan, and all the other charts that they were doing. They're all real. Not very many people. Actually, I don't know about our audience. That's not contemporary jazz. Well, Whiplash isn't contemporary jazz, I don't think. I think it's it's modern. Yeah, but it's not. But it's not modern. Modern. Like it's not something that came out in the two thousands. Okay, everyone, we're back, and yeah, we're gonna dig into the plot a little bit more, of course. Anyways, uh, we open with Neiman, Andrew Neiman, I suppose I should say, always looking down and not having the most confidence, practicing the drums, and is noticed by Fletcher, the beginning of a super toxic relationship, I'd say. Oh, I totally agree with you. With an invitation to Fletcher's Ben, Newman now has a boost of confidence in his life, so much so he decides to ask out a girl. What's her name? Nicole. <laughs> ah, Right. I mean, I just kind of want to say that because, yeah. like, she has a small part. She doesn't have a last name, but she has a name. <laughs> Anyways, well, that confident boost isn't great since now Neiman has, can't seem to take no for an answer to anyone. He breaks up with Nicole because she's a distraction to him. And even after a major car accident, he still won't be denied playing the drums. Bringing it all to a head with the career-defining showdown in the form of a trap performance orchestrated by the, a scorned Fletcher. Yeah, exactly. So there are, there's a whole oh man. There are so many things that we can talk about here, and that's not even just about music, seeing as how this is a music movie. But let's talk a little bit about the about our characters first. So we've got Andrew Neiman, portrayed by Miles Teller, our protagonist. What are your What are your thoughts on him? I like, have, I absolutely have to root for him. He's a Miles. <laughs> so you're rooting for him all the time, right? No, 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 not all the time. But okay. he's a Miles, and he's doing a good job. So I definitely root for him. Okay. Unlike some of those people from the BLM situations. All right. There is one police officer who. Oh, oh yeah, his name oh, is Miles. Yeah. Right, 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 right. I was like, what? He loses the title of Miles. He's now nameless, in my opinion. <laughs> You got to root for him just because of his uh, of his actor, huh? Yep. <laughs> well, I'd be honestly so, though he did do a great job. Um, mm -hmm. Jokes aside and everything. So, but what do you think about Neiman as a character? Like, did you think it was a good character? So, I personally think Neiman is a one dimensional character, mm -hmm. but the people who kind of get to his situation mm -hmm. and become great are one dimensional. Uh, I would argue he probably has a little bit of autism, um, He's got especially in the way he talks. You can hear it. Oh, oh! What does that say about me, Miles? So, what does it say about me? Like, 
I know. What are you I talking know, about? I know. I know. I'm just kidding. I'm really. saying that he <laughs> he's good at what he does, and he's not good at what he doesn't do. Which is ask quite, women out. <laughs> well, I feel like just interacting in general with other people. I mean, because he doesn't even really talk to any of the other of his bandmates. Although, to be fair, I, I think that's orchestrated by the oh, next person we're going to talk uh, about, Terrence, Terrence Fletcher. Fletcher. So, what did you think of this guy? Uh, well, like I said, I like J.K. Simmons. So, mm-hmm. by all means, Simmons, if you ever get a hold of this, you're a great person, and I really like you. But the character you played was a piece of shit and garbage. Wish you would die. Um, <laughs> and I've been. I was rooting. I was hoping, like throughout the entire time, that uh, Neiman would actually jump him mm. and finish the job. And just go to town, right? Like, you know, take teeth as trophies. I, oh, I'd be okay yeah. with it. I'd actually be okay with that. I <laughs> I have a very certain disdain for your character. And uh, you did There's a great job. There's nothing like, wrong with that, The right? fact that you actually drove me to be angry. You drove me to be angry. That doesn't happen, man. Like, yeah. oh, good job. I'm... If I met you, I'm going to have to shake your hand and you'll probably see me just tear up just a little bit because I liked what you did. You actually got a, a negative emotional response out of me, which says something. Can you imagine if you did that and if he actually said his line from here about that? What are you, one of those single tear people? <laughs> I'd be like, no, they dried up long ago. <laughs> All right. So we've got uh, two other, I'd say, really important people. So we've got Jim Neiman, portrayed by Paul Reiser, and that's uh, Andrew's father. So his character mm-hmm. really reminds me of your dad, like in mannerisms and that. Like, what what is with you in choosing movies where, like, the father figure, like, really reminds me of your dad? I don't know. I'm not doing this on purpose. <laughs> Maybe it's because my relationship with my dad is a little... Strained? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, strained, because I work for him. So he's no longer a father. He's just a boss. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can see that. Okay, so outside of him being my dad, I guess. Uh, he's very, uh, like, he really supports mm-hmm. um, Newman, mm-hmm. or Teller, or Andrew. Andrew. Well, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? He really got- supports Andrew, his son. Even though, as you were saying while we were watching the movie, it doesn't seem like he would have a stable job in what we see as jobs here in the Western world. Um, yeah, as far as I don't music agree goes, with right? That. Yeah, yeah, I don't agree with that at all. And, like, I really wish and hope that you can get work here mm. and be successful. As opposed to me going to a different continent to be successful. Yeah, but then at the same time, if you do that, then that means I have to come to you and we can do hunting trips there. That would be very interesting. I mean, I know hunting is a thing in Germany, but... Uh, I would absolutely very much like to figure out how the heck it works before I move there, (laughs) and then find out how many of my firearms I'd be allowed to legally take with me. Yeah, that that is a side rail for a completely different forum, I'd say. But getting back on uh, Neil, (laughs) on uh, Jim, Mm -hmm. like he's a really good father, and he just wants to see his son be happy. Happy, That kind of makes me. That kind of makes me question about the whole autism thing, because Uh like maybe he is. Like, quite autistic in the sense of, like, the father kind of knows that Mm. he's not going to be able to hold down a regular job, I guess you'd say, or, like, interact with society that way. And he does have to be kind of taken care of. Mm -hmm. And if he's good at music, Mm -hmm. at least he has something to hold on to. And that really speaks a lot about his father and, like... Like, that's such a great thing. That is great, honestly. Okay, and then we have Nicole, portrayed by Melissa Benoist. I mean, she's kind of minor, but I still think she's kind of important. Even though we don't um, really get to know a whole lot about her. We know more about her than we do anyone else in his band. Like, let's no, be... No, I'm going to argue that. Okay. Uh, the redhead. Uh, which one? Oh, the redhead drummer. Oh, oh, okay, right. Uh, I don't think I, he's. I think we know just okay, about right. as much about him as yeah. we do Nicole. I don't think he has and, red hair, but I know who you're talking about, right? Yeah, the Irish guy. I, I don't remember his name because I they think, never said it. No, I'm pretty sure I said it like once. I think Tanner is his last name. Tanner? Yeah, yeah Tanner. Tanner. Yeah, right, the one Tanner. that he replaces, right? 
Yeah. No, Tanner was the one he, that uh, Newman replaces. Yeah. I'm talking about the other one. Oh, you mean the, the guy that, from when they were in... Um, the one that he when like, he's picked in up the, right away and like was started to play, and he wasn't doing a very good job, but... Uh, but he brought him in as almost kind of like this weird pseudo make Neiman play better or whatever. Wait, We'll, I, we'll talk about that later, but unfortunately with this movie, uh, there is no female cast for it. Connolly, Ryan yeah, Connolly. Connolly, that's the name of, Connolly, that, of yeah. that drummer, right. Okay, okay. I don't so, think he has red hair either, but whatever. Well, blonde hair, I guess. He and he did not have brown hair. Yeah, uh, it was if it was brown, it was super light. So, but uh, okay, no, so. I I hate to say it because so she's a plot device. She is yeah. because the whole point that she plays is he gets the confidence to ask her out, and then he gets so involved that he breaks up with her. There was nothing else there. Fair enough. Uh, this does not pass that. Uh, the Bechdel the test. The Bechdel test at oh. all. This this barely even graces the Bechdel test. <laughs> that would require there being more than one female character present ever in this film, and either of them having a speaking role, which does not happen. Uh, well, the mother does speak. Yes. Well, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's his aunt. Or his aunt, yeah. Yeah. That's right. But that's it. There, She's the only woman at that dinner table, and yeah. just like Nicole... So, like, there are girls in the bands, one or two, but they never talk. Again, that's kind of about, that says more about uh, about Fletcher. That's very true. <laughs> this is not, we'll a, get into that this is not a feminist everyone. movie, obviously. No. But, <laughs> I mean, I just figured that I would have her there because she is, Melissa Benoist is, is a bigger deal than some of the other people that they have in there. So, I mean, she gets billing. So, yeah, you know, Which, you, you, you work with what you got, right? That's like uh, having the Joker as... Uh, Wait, so what, what? The Joker? Having her playing this is like Jared Leto in... Uh, oh, the it, oh, right, in, in, in Suicide Squad. In Suicide Squad, exactly. Oh. You know, there's like 10 minutes of him in there. And yet it's all that, well, I'm and pretty it, sure that not a lot of people necessarily talked about Melissa Benoit being in this because she doesn't have that big of a role, as opposed to Joker, considering it's Joker, and everybody talked about it because everybody always got to talk about Joker and the stupid things you do on set because the Joker's crazy. And Good old method acting. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I feel like they could have utilized her more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like showed her being like very supportive in his music thing and then him turning back <clears throat> and backlashing against her because he wants to be better and he feels that she's holding him back. I feel like that would have been better. Yeah. Uh, but just having them have one date and then all of a sudden he's like, I'm breaking up with you because you're going to hold me back. Uh, that really speaks about how shitty of a character um, Andrew, well, I Andrew mean, Newman is shitty character. Well, it talks about like, him as a shitty person, I would say. Because, well, so but I'm the only reason why he's sure. doing this is because of the toxicity between uh, Fletcher and him. Well, which I mean, that does kind of make an, sense. That's kind of an important thing to talk about, though, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but it feels like I feel like it could have been explored better. Mm, I feel okay, like at I the agree. end of the day, maybe Nicole realizes what's going on, and he's like, or she says, "Hey." This is happening. Uh -huh. Look at this. You're being destroyed by this man. And then maybe he flips around and he's like, oh, no, this isn't Stockholm Syndrome. You're, you're holding me back. You're trying to make me a normal person. I so as opposed, to, as opposed to his dad kind of doing that, right? Or, yeah. or, or doing it in addition, right? To kind of just kind of show that there are other people that are outside of the band that are realizing, uh, that's not good. Yeah. This is not healthy. You should not be there. But I mean, so they're both, I think, first year college university students. So they're 18, 19. I'm not exactly expecting her to perhaps be the most mature or him either, considering the way he acts. That's true. I agree with you on that. But at the same time, I feel like going through high school, uh, mm. especially being as pretty as she w she is. Mm hmm. She would have some experience. I can, <laughs> I can totally, I can totally understand Andrew not having that experience mm -hmm. because of the kind of person he is when he talks. Right. Like as they said in the beginning, 
uh, whenever you talk to me, you always looked at the ground. I never mm -hmm. actually saw your eyes. Yep. You know, so that kind of tells me about who Andrew is as a person. He mm -hmm. doesn't like that eye contact. He feels very threatened by it. Right. Whereas Nicole isn't. So I think that there could have been way more dynamic played out with here. And I feel like they totally underutilized her. Agreed. I absolutely agree, especially considering that she basically only has four, well, I guess in a way she's only really in four scenes. Um, and so there's not really a whole lot for her to work with. It's kind of a shame. In a way, it's kind of interesting considering that one of the follow-ups to this by the same director was La La Land. And the whole point of that is about a similar relationship dynamic. And Emma Stone is, in a way, way more focused on than Ryan Gosling in terms of like the, the relationship there. So, I don't know. Maybe he learned his lesson when he was making La La Land. It's true, but uh, <laughs> personally, I can't... It's hard for me because I don't... I can't see guys as attractive. Like, I don't know what makes men attractive. I know what makes women attractive to me. And Emma Stone is gorgeous and Ryan Gosling is a guy. So... <laughs> <laughs> you not see that Sorry. Miles... Do you not see that Miles Teller and Ryan Gosling might attract different people for different reasons, though? Again, do I don't... I can't notice? see. Okay. I can't see what All makes right. a guy attractive. Okay. All it right. It just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> okay. Then I don't, I don't... This is not a road we need to go down. <laughs> Okay. All right. So, yeah, absolutely major bummer that Melissa Benoist did not have more to do in this. Because I think she totally would have done great. Absolutely agree. Uh, I feel like there was a lot of wasted potential there. Sorry. Well, uh, that's too bad. But, uh, okay. So, let's move on to another talking point here. Um, we should probably address this right now. Since you brought it up in the introduction. So, you've experienced a Fletcher before? Yes. Um, so, in order to understand this, I'm going to kind of go into my history a little bit here. All right. Um, back um, in grade three, actually, no, not grade three, about grade five, me and my really, really close friend, a friend who I've known since I was six months old, mm -hmm. had this great idea. We're going to start a band because he was a very talented musician. Um, he also has a little bit of autism, and he's really good at playing guitar. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if he picked up a guitar now, he could play it, even though he hadn't touched a guitar in probably about 20 years. But he could probably still do it. Mm -hmm. Now, because of this, I'm the kind of person that when I when I think about doing something, I'm at least going to try it. Yep. So he was also a big car guy, and uh, I got my license way before him. He got his license when he was 18. I got it when I was 14 for my learners, 16 for my drivers. Right. Same with guitar. I picked up bass guitar right away and started to play. Mm -hmm. um, my music teacher, uh, his name was Smith. Uh, he was a great teacher, but he recognized I had some faults and mm -hmm. he worked with me with them. Uh, one thing is I can't read notes. Mm -hmm. I'm very bad at reading notes. Uh, it's because I have a little thing called Erlen syndrome. And mm -hmm. basically for long story short, whenever I read anything that has high contrast, like black on white, white on black. Right. Imagine the words and letters floating on water. Mm -hmm. That's what it's like for me to read. Now, try doing that with music. Where things are already kind of, you know, all over the place as it is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially when they start getting off the bloody uh, lines. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, did that ever piss me off. But, of course, I played tuba in high school. So, of course, it's always down there below the staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I played bass guitar and my music teacher, Smith, was awesome. I loved him. And, uh, you know, I would love to go out. Maybe I'll go out and have coffee with him one day and talk to him about this. Uh, he'd be a little heartbroken to hear about it, but, like, he really had a lot of faith in me as a student. And a lot of I had a lot of promise for him. Now, I played bass guitar first. And mm -hmm. uh, when I got into junior high school, I started to play tuba. And that's when I really started to notice my issues with reading music because I wasn't a great tuba Because now, you, tuba now you have to actually read notes. Yeah. So I struggle. There's no tab version for tuba, or at least none that I have ever seen. If there <laughs> is, I would love to know it. Yeah. I would probably would have invented it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have your 
lines and it just shows your three uh, fingers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you're, so you have three lines and then uh, whenever you mark them to show what fingers you need, yep. uh, you correspond that with some sort of number for yeah, what right. pitch you need to play at. Yeah. So carrying on, trying to make this long story <laughs> short, um, the music teacher knew I had some issues with this, mm -hmm. but he knew that I was a very competent player and I played with a lot of emotion. Mm, that's so, always good. Yeah. So he loved it. And he knew I played bass guitar, and I kind of played bass guitar a little bit with them. Uh, there was a bit of a small jazz group that was starting mm -hmm. up, but I was doing too much at the same time. I wasn't really able to play with them. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Appleby actually gave me recommendation in high school to skip playing in band and go really? straight to jazz. Nice. Because he knew that I had the talent. Now... Mm -hmm. I never really played a whole lot of jazz. I've listened to a lot of jazz, but not really playing it. So I had a, a long struggle ahead of me, and I kind of recognized it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where it gets a little confusing, where my music teacher for jazz was also uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, so I'm going to call him Baldy, because he was bald, just like J.K. Just, just just like like, JK, JK like Fletcher's uh, oh, J.K. God, Simmons' man. character, just like Fletcher. Jeez. Now... I didn't know this at the time because to me, I learned jazz from the beginning because that's what my music teacher who had long brown hair, um, the good, the, the good, good Smith, Smith. <laughs> not Agent Smith, good Smith. <laughs> uh, he showed me music from then, from the beginning of jazz and it was going to build me up to what jazz is. Now, unfortunately, because of the, t the schedule and everything, I got an extreme dose of what jazz is now. Now, talking with uh, another person who loves music, uh, Kevin, uh, he's my oldest mm -hmm. friend's dad. Mm -hmm. um, I did learn about jazz. Who also jazz. loves jazz? Uh, he likes jazz, but he's more of a heavy metal rock guy. Um, he's beautiful taste in music and has a huge repertoire of albums. Unbelievably mm -hmm. big. So big, they will not actually insure it. They say we do not insure record uh, studios because you cannot replace a lot of that stuff yeah <laughs> so anyways what happens uh what happened is i had a huge struggle because i can't read notes i can only read tablature and if i had to and if they're not going to provide that for you then i had to get trouble. it translated and yep. luckily i'm a kind of charismatic people people kind of like me a little bit uh, so I got one of the guys to help me out with that and work through everything with me. And I wrote everything out in tablature and played off of that. Mm -hmm. Another issue I had, because I like what jazz originally was, and that's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. About free expression. And about free expression. Right? And yeah. that I would play what I felt was right, what, it, what felt right in the song, and not paying attention to what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. And that pissed off... Baldy. Bad Smith or Baldy? Agent Smith, yeah. Bad Smith. Pissed him off royally. So he had it out for me at the beginning. And mm -hmm. it was very similar to this uh, relationship that they had. The difference is I fought back. Mm. And of I course... I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. I am not a... Uh, I am a very calm and composed person until you piss me off. And then when you piss me off, the gloves come off. Well, it's less necessarily about like your demeanor, more in the sense of your strength of personality. That's what I mean, because I've known you for long enough that I know that you don't stand for certain for stuff. Yes. So, of course, he was very punishing to me because I couldn't read the music. And he mm. didn't like the fact that he couldn't just give me a sheet of music and I was able to play it. So I'd have to stand back, let everybody else play it, listen to it. And then write everything out as I'm working on it, trying to figure out this tab the tablature for the notes. Uh, this actually came all down to a humongous fight between part of the band, mainly me, mm -hmm. and this guy. To which I straight out called him a Nazi. Because that's basically what kind of... That's the, the way, way I feel acting, about... Uh, right? yeah. yeah, and that's exactly how it is here. As far as I'm concerned, uh, Teller is fascist. He has full control over it. You're and he breaks everybody down. Fletcher. Or Fletcher, yeah. Fletcher, Fletcher, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting your last names confused again. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Fletcher is a fascist because he breaks everything down and tries to do it his way because mm -hmm. his way is the right way. Yep. And there is no other way. Yep. All other ways are incorrect and must be... Removed. Removed. And 
that's basically how it all turned for me. And I actually, when I left, I took like half of that jazz group with me because <laughs> they were pissed at him too. Like, how dare he do this to a student? He actually got removed from the school we did. And here's the best part. He ended up going to an, a very predominant school mm -hmm. for music where we live. And he ended up actually fucking over music for my girlfriend's sister. No. No. Yeah. He went there? Yes. No. Oh, oh, man. That was my high school. Now, Fuck. she had so much talent that she actually got offered record labels. Oh. And he ruined it for her. I... Oh. That's so sad considering the instructors that I had when I was in high school because they're like the opposite of that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm probably, you know, a musician because of the instructors that I had through junior high, high school, and other places. Oh, man. Absolutely. I probably would Good be thing I didn't. Good thing I didn't go to the same high school as you because yeah. I, I was in jazz band. And so that means I probably would have been there and probably would have butted heads with him. Oh, absolutely. Um, except for the fact that I know how to read music. But I'm a stubborn person, too, as you know. And yeah, so that's kind of my relationship with music. Um, after that time, I dropped playing bass guitar. I never picked a guitar, bass guitar up then. I tried to play guitar recently, and I just can't do it because it just brings me back to that whole... What I understand what music was it mm -hmm. comes from a very, I guess you could say, punk rock background. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's what I grew up mainly listening to, performing, and learning from. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no room for that in, uh, in, the, in the fatherland. So... <laughs> oh, boy. It's so... What is sad to me is that your story, I have heard it so many times. I've heard it from instructors in my university programs. I've heard it from people that say, yep, I, I'm i not a performer. Like, I don't have a career because I, you know, had all of this promise or whatever. And then I went and I did an undergrad and the teacher that I had, like the, the instrument teacher that I had, they were awful. And they made me hate singing. They made me hate playing piano or whatever. And I never wanted to do it again. But then I went and I did, a, you know, another degree or something like that and paired up with another teacher who was more nurturing or whatever. And here we are. Now I'm an instructor. You know, I, I do a little bit of performing, but I will, just like you, I, I cannot do that ever again because of that scarring. And it's, it's sad and horrible. I mean, the stuff that he puts uh, Newman through. Yep. Like, if I saw that in somebody, even if I didn't know them, mm -hmm. I would say something. And that says something because no I'm the one kind of says person. anything in the movie either. Yeah. No one in the band. I'm the kind of person who normally, if I saw somebody, you know what, this happened once before. And I'll actually open the story up because I won't use names because I barely remember any of them. Um... My girlfriend called me, said she needed a ride and she had an issue and to pick her up at this McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, sure, whatever. Not a big deal to me. I went over, I drove over, picked her up, um, went into McDonald's and she's sitting there with a girl. And she said to me, you know, this girl's having some issues. She wants to break up with her, um, her interest, uh, what do you say, her partner. Because mm -hmm. this partner was also a girl. She disclosed this beforehand too. So mm -hmm. I was very aware. And uh, she said, is there anything you can do to help her be able to, like, get her stuff and, like, not interact with this person? Now, I, see. I was working at Wholesale Sports. I understand the laws for personal protection in Canada very well. And uh, the laws had just recently came out. There was a bit of a change. And you are allowed to provide protection to people as mm -hmm. long as they ask for it. Yep. You are not allowed to intervene if they do not ask for it. So I said, yes, this is what I can do for you. But here's what you have to do for me. This person is going to show up. I'm telling you that right now. Mm -hmm. You're going to be in the middle of packing. Mm -hmm. They are going to show up. You have to say to me, you do not want them near you. If you say that, I'm allowed to block them from entering the room. And I can react any way that I deem necessary, which will be escalated slowly. I'm not mm -hmm. the person to go reaching for a knife 
if the person's just being chubby. Right. So she said, yes, I understand. I said, okay, it's going to be hard, but I need you to remember, you have to say this to me. Mm -hmm. They're going to show up and they will more than likely try to stop you from doing this and leaving. Yep. So I went there. We had everything understood. She started to pack up. The car showed up. And I said, okay, they are here. So I stood in front of the doorway in the kitchen so that she could go down to the basement, get everything done. Mm -hmm. She walks in the door and goes to walk into the kitchen. And uh, the girl was up there, the one I was supposed to be protecting. And I said to her, what's the plan? And she froze. She didn't say anything. So, of course, I'm not allowed to intervene. I had to let that happen. And, of course... She walked over, tried to confront her. She pushed her away, said no. Then I pulled her out, put her outside and said, look, you're not allowed in here right now. And she freaked out. She went upstairs, put a hole through a uh, door. And I said, not my problem. You're not allowed in here right now. So then she, I forget what she did, but she managed to, oh yeah, that's right. The other girl, the one that I was protecting, went upstairs to get something. And of Mm -hmm. course I went up with her. And she didn't say that I need you to protect me. So I wasn't allowed to do anything. That's when they had an interaction and everything kind of calmed down. And I said to her, this is kind of a mistake. You did the wrong thing here. The cycle is going to continue. Mm. And I'm pretty sure it did because we left. We gave the police report. Mm -hmm. Uh, The police stood there looking at me like, you managed to actually like stand between like a same sex couple and like mediate it perfectly like that says a lot about you <laughs> and like, like not that. escalate things especially after she put her fist through a door and that like I feel like that says a lot about the police too but yeah that's a <laughs> so I good did, for you I, I did all this and the thing is it comes to the rule that you can't help somebody who doesn't ask for the help absolutely absolutely and you have to be careful about who you give help to you have to see them actually doing what they can for the help this is one of those cases where I would actually go against that. And so I would you need actively to intervene, right? intervene yeah. because this is a brainwashing technique that needs mm, to be disabled and removed. Yeah. Um, so kind of, uh, there's a few kind of different ways I feel that I could take this conversation, but um, I'm going to go with this one. <clears throat> so some of the criticism that I've seen about this film is that people think that Fletcher is unrealistic everything that he does is unrealistic or maybe is something that couldn't happen today i i can kind of understand that um the director has been quite open about the inspiration for the story uh for the film being his own experience in high school jazz band and having his own run-in with a fletcher so This probably would have been in like the 90s or something when he would have been in high school. But you just said that this happened to you. And then that same person continued to do it about five or six years later, which means that that would have been like in the 2010s, not too long either before or around the same time that this movie would have been coming out. Yes. So they're so they're wrong. This happens all the time. Yes. And it needs to be dealt with. You know what? This actually reminds me of a quote. A uh, quote that I hold very dear. Evil prevails when good men do nothing. Yes, I agree. So it's very predominant here. Well, it's the paradox of tolerance, right? Or I mean, I think you've... Have you heard of that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. if you react too soon, then you're the evildoer. But if you... Despite react... the fact that you know that you need to do something before it gets worse, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, I and that's mean, kind of the paradox with personal protection. When when is enough enough? And yeah, that's right. kind of the thing that I don't agree with the American idea ideologies of personal protection, mm-hmm. and uh, Canadian like with, ones like are with, not like also with Castle reason. Doctrine and stand your ground and that sort of stuff. Yeah, I don't agree with that all to a point, but it how with how things are written, mm-hmm. that makes sense and it works. Right, in but the in practice. In practice, it's messy, mm-hmm. and same same up here with our no tolerance, mm-hmm. uh, where like fighting Anything, back is yep. not allowed because yep. it's not what you're supposed to do. Well, again, if good men do nothing, evil prevails. So, what do you want? If you don't fight back against that person who is well, 
I mean, if someone pulls a knife on you and they have it at your throat, maybe it might just be a good idea to just kind of comply with what they're telling you to do. And then after you get out of that situation, then you do something about it. Absolutely. But at the same time... No need to be a <clears throat> hero and get yourself killed. At the same time, though, if you ever heard about the Wi-Fi um, massacre? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe? Go into this a little bit. I might. So Wi-Fi is actually a store in the States, uh, sort of like Circuit City, the source. Uh, okay, yeah. So what happened was in the States, uh, three armed robbers broke into the, or entered a store, mm -hmm. uh, gathered up all of their hostages, looted the place, mm -hmm. uh, took the belongings of the people, and uh, said that they were going to leave their phones, but that they had to do is actually take this uh, liquid, and that would knock them out. And then that would allow them to get away. Now, at the end of the day, that liquid was Drano. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Drano liquefies anything that is organic. I was about to say, I'm just like, so they're about to commit mass murder? Yes. And I think there was about eight people in that store. Uh, they did get away with it, by the way. They were caught later. Um, but <laughs> well, again. That's good. <laughs> sure. Yes. Comply with somebody who has a knife with your throat. Mm -hmm. And then something like that happens. When is the right time? Again, there is no right time. It's, the right time is to stop before it even starts. But uh, right. when the act is happening, the best time to stop it is as soon as you possibly can. Because you don't know what the casualties will be. Mm -hmm. And in the, that case, uh, dying from Drano. Like a lot of people use this uh, as a reason why they're pro-firearm and pro-gun like gun rights and mm -hmm. killing people and killing your attackers and that. Mm -hmm. uh, death by Drano sucks. It is a very ugly thing and nobody deserves that. Death by bullet sucks too, depending on where you get shot. Yes, it, absolutely. <laughs> As does getting stabbed. <laughs> death just sucks in general. Death just sucks in general. If, the, you know, if there is a quick way to go, then that's great. But even then, sometimes it... Not every person is going to respond to a bullet to the head the way a deer does sometimes, where it just falls over and it's over in a couple seconds. And there are people who have been shot in the head two or yes, three times and survived. Yes, yes exactly. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's so, it's a really strange thing. Yeah, uh, so is there... You know, there is no right thing. Yeah. There never is and there never will be. The, mm -hmm. Well, the right thing is to stop it before it starts. Mm -hmm. Which, um, a little bit off topic here... <laughs> So that is one thing I absolutely do love about the show Static Shock. Mm -hmm. Recently, um, Saber Spark did a special on Static Shock mm -hmm. talking about the one episode about mass shootings. And it kind of goes through and shows how the main character, what was his name again? I don't uh, remember what. Well, Static which, Shock, yeah. mm -hmm. as a kid, uh, was talking to a therapist about the whole ordeal and uh, recalling it. And he, he said he felt... He felt weak and unable to do anything because of the situation. Because he didn't know what to do. He right? felt extremely powerless. Yeah. A superhero felt powerless well before the edgy, dark superhero stuff happened. And uh, no, I, I, I think that they showed a really good thing about this show. That mm -hmm. a lot of this could be stopped by a good community, a supporting community. Yes. That doesn't exclude, but includes. So it's not necessarily about, you know, a good actor who has a gun or anything like that, right? It's no. about everybody, which honestly speaks well to, well, I mean, you were saying that what Fletcher's doing is brainwashing, right? Absolutely. Like, it makes perfect sense when you look at the fact that everyone in the band is just as toxic as he is. They're swearing at each other. They're, you know... Well, okay. I mean, to I've, my drums. Don't touch my drum kit. Yeah, don't touch my sticks. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to touch my book, even yep. though like all that stuff. Even even though like they don't even have the same music because one is a is a brass player and the other one's a drummer. Like, yeah. Oh, holy shit. I mean, okay. So I'm I mean I'm a musician, right? Um, and I have experienced people that are like that too. So I mean, sometimes there's you're kind of a jerk and you have really bad jokes kind of like that. And it's like, I'm not sure if you're joking or if you're just being an asshole. And if you're being an asshole, could you maybe not? Cause we got to work together. 
And it's not fun to perform with someone who is not nice. Like, it's one thing if you're being a villain and you're supposed to be not nice in this scene. But then when you continue acting that way, when we have walked off the stage, that's not cool anymore because I don't like being around you. Yeah, exactly. Um, And uh, I have been told that quite a few times through my education, I mean, I'm a professional now, so most of the people that we see in this film, I don't spend time with anymore because they're not there, because they got weeded out in a way, because the community rejected them, because... They don't want them there anymore. I, going with the whole, you know, critics say that, oh, people like this don't exist anymore. Oh, they do. They absolutely do. It's just that they're not high profile anymore. They maybe used to be high profile. Then Me Too happened. And, you know, even someone like James Levine gets outed as a sex pest and gets turfed from the Met and every other high profile place that he had. And... No one really wanted to have anything to do with him anymore after that point. But there are still people at smaller local levels. I mean, a bit of a a story. When I did um, a show a couple of years ago in person, (laughs) um, people that I was talking to, and this had actually not been too long after James Levine had been outed as a, a sex pest, Um, and had all his removals and everything like that. And, you know, all that high profile stuff, it was also happening in some smaller communities. And so there was a choir director who was also assaulting women in his choirs, in his ensembles. And everyone was just kind of going along with it because he was such a great director. He had all these great ideas and his interpretations for how performances were supposed to be done were phenomenal and everybody wanted to work with him. And here I am chatting with a few sopranos and there's a couple other guys with us too. And I'm listening to one of these girls talk about how I don't think it was that she had been in this ensemble, but she knew people who had. And, you know, therefore, six degrees of separation probably knew one of the people that was assaulted. And they talked about how, can you believe this? They came out and they made their allegations and everything. And he got, you know, thrown out and he was removed from a lot of the places that he was had. And then next thing I'm looking and he is um, he's a judge or something at a at a, at a festival or he is doing, he has like a smaller ensemble or something that he just kind of put together and is going out there. How's that fair? And I'm sitting there going, you're right, that's not fair because the community spoke and they didn't want him around anymore. But then one of the other guys that I was with, he said, well, but he's a great artist, so everybody wants to work with him. It's actually kind of interesting because I'm like, dude, did you not listen to what the fuck she just said you're kind of denying her like what the shit that's not okay but it's (laughs) people people in positions of power need to be closely watched for that kind of stuff Mm -hmm, absolutely because like as soon as you start getting these cracks especially up high then they're going to let people underneath them do that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. then that just goes downhill. Yep. And that wrecks the whole system. Mm-hmm. You have to be very punctual about that. I mean, like, this is coming from a guy who's a manager of the gun counter. And, like, I... My job there wasn't to deal with people. My job mm-hmm. is there to deal with the firearms. Mm-hmm. And I got... I, like, woke up at 3 in the morning to show up and worked to, like seven at night to find out every single rifle in our store, make sure it had its number, make sure it was registered, all of that fun stuff, make sure all the firearms that do come in for repairs are sent out, make sure that they're all recorded, handguns, Mm -hmm. prohibited, because we had a couple prohibited in our store. Ah, that was, oh yes, I remember those uh, days. At the end of the day, I did all of my numbers, I ran everything up, I triple checked everything, and I walked up to the store manager and said, okay, we're missing five rifles and three handguns. Two of those handguns are still registered to us. 
So what do you, you want know. to do about this? How are we going to contact the RCMP and inform them of this? Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, we're not really going to do that. To which I immediately said, then I am not staying in this position mm -hmm. because it's all going to come back to me. Yep. You're going to be the fall guy when they, they come and investigate. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you got to, you have to make sure that the people up top are doing things right. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes there are scandals where like something looked like something was happening, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I do know that in... Um, in a few areas that has actually happened <laughs> where somebody came out and was like, Oh, I got, you know, I got molested by this person. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out, no, no, that wasn't the case. That was like a miscommunication or something or like it never happened. And that person was just lying. So you got to watch out for that, but you still have to watch them very closely. Mm -hmm. um, people in positions of power. Well, they attract people who want that power mm -hmm. and who are not going to use it right. Yeah. I feel, I'll try to wrap this back into talking about <laughs> Whiplash. I mean, this is great. I'm really enjoying it. Again, this is, this is why I love this movie. And again, it's so interesting because it's like the reasons why I love it seem to also be why people hate it. I think, again, it's this sort of thing about how I look at it and I say, this is real. This is happening right now. And people are like, no, 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 no. There's no way that's happening. And I'm sitting there going, yes, it is. Quit putting your head in the sand. Yeah. If it happened before, it's going to happen again. Absolutely. If it's, if it's not happening now, it will happen soon. Exactly. If we're not going to do anything about it. Um, but So kind of on a different track, let's talk a little bit about Andrew Neiman. So his stated goal in the film is that he wants to be one of the greats of music. He wants to, you know, be the next Buddy Rich or Bird or Charlie Parker, his actual name, I guess. But I personally, as a professional musician, think he's going about it the wrong way. And absolutely, Fletcher is not the person he should be, like, idolizing or even looking to as far as mentorship goes, if that's what he wants to do. What do you think about that? Um, I do agree with you on that, but it does kind of come with the, uh, comes with the whole citation of, of the genre of music he is in. Uh, specifically talking about jazz? Yes. By the looks of it, especially because they show that video of him when he's a kid playing the drums, he was right. playing jazz. So mm -hmm. that means his dad listened to a lot of jazz, which is what brought him into music. Mm -hmm. That I'm going to make some assumptions here and that uh, I'm going to. I think, right I think that's a fair assumption to make because yeah. we don't see him talk about anything outside of jazz. So, like, personally, uh, I came through music through, like, I thought I liked music mm -hmm. when I was listening to what my parents listened to, which was country music and the Beatles. Don't get me wrong. The Beatles are great, but they're not my kind of music. The first time music actually meant something to me was when I heard Kryptonite by Three Doors Down, uh, and that was at... Uh, my oldest friend's house, his dad exposed me to it. And that's when I knew that I love music. That and is... I didn't really consider the country that my parents listened to good music because it didn't have that emotion <laughs> behind it. What were you listening to like Alan Jackson and Billy Ray Cyrus? And... Oh God. Okay. Yep. So <laughs> I'm not a fan either. <laughs> so when it comes, bringing this back on topic here, when it comes to the, what, what I'm talking about is he asked himself, how do I become not only the best musician, but the best jazz musician? Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to point this direction. Now, unfortunately, this is why I really don't like jazz too, because I kind of figured this out uh, through my teacher, Mr. Smith. Mm -hmm. Jazz music, uh, for you guys who are listening that don't know much about music, all maybe one of you, maybe two. Jazz was originally a construct of the black communities in America, and it was a way of them expressing themselves. And what ends up happening uh, with jazz music now, the more modern stuff, is it gets super rigid. Mm -hmm. And as you've said, it's like you have to perform exactly what it is as it is at the moment it must be played. No room for error. Yeah. It's, Which is basically reincarcerating them again. <laughs> it's it's really weird. I, so one of my um, well, he's a very dear friend of mine now, but uh, at the time, my music history professor in my undergrad, he's a, he's a saxophonist, 
And so he does lots of jazz. He does lots of like avant-garde stuff. Um, it's kind of required since it's a saxophone. And so saxophones didn't exist before they were created in like the late 19th, late 19th century. You can play Bach and things like that on the saxophone, but that's not what it was made for. And uh, anyway, so we uh, listened to some more modern jazz and we saw some jazz performances. Um, but the interesting thing was that while I had always thought, oh, this is really great. They, they do this really well. They're really great performers and everything. I thought they did really well. You know, the solos were really tight and everything and everyone seemed to know what they were doing. And I remember him talking about that saying, here's the funny thing about jazz. So jazz is all about free expression. Jazz is kind of about throwing out the rules and just kind of almost in a way doing your own thing and everyone just kind of going along with you and then someone else takes over and they go along with them and you just kind of pass it around. But now one of the other things about jazz is that because you're throwing out the rules, that means that when you want to change it, you need to throw those out, those rules out and you need to do something else. So it's gotten to the point now when you look at those mod, those guys doing, you know, modern jazz stuff that's just been written, you know, like a year or two ago, it's super rigid because you throw the rules out and recreate things so many times that you get to a point where you just, you, you have to do it that way. And if you do it a different way, then you're not doing that type of jazz anymore. And so you're stuck in a way. This, this was also part of a, a larger discussion about modern music and so modern and postmodern music where it's like you throw out the rules you and then you throw out the rules again and you get to a point where most people don't actually want to come and see your performances because the music that you're doing is not what they hear on the radio. It's not Beethoven. It's not Bach. It's not Mozart. And so it's it requires, in a way, it, it's, it's almost like that Rick and Morty meme, you know, about the whole, you need to have a high IQ to truly understand it. And that's what I don't like about music. That is exactly what I don't like about it. I like to go to a concert and hear hear them throw something out that, like, nobody would ever expect them to do mm -hmm. for instance it's kind of funny because i feel sort of the same way about certain i mean there is some really wacky music that i listen to that i love and then i play it for other people and they're like you actually enjoy this and i go i do yeah <laughs> no i like it don't get me wrong the stuff on the radio is fine and it's great it's great to introduce you to more more artists mm -hmm. and you know get get things going I don't listen to the radio very much anymore because it all became it's the very same repetitive. Thing. Yeah, and uh, I like to hear the songs that people aren't showing. For instance, "Tango Till You're Sore." Wait, so say that again. So "Tango Till You're Sore." Yeah, "Tango Till You're Sore" by Tom Waits. Oh, um, he's oh. actually a fairly well-known musician, but this mm -hmm. isn't a song that's super well-known. Like, it has its own cult following because right. It's actually talking about this exact same thing. Right. Uh, you know, it's not play the music and let them tango until they're sore. Yeah. It's not like his uh, but, Down in the Hole is like the one big Tom Waits song that everybody has heard of. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I love this song because it really speaks to me in the sense of like, you know, sure, everybody just wants to hear the same old, same old. But what's making the artist come up with something new? I mean, why not mm. change things up a little? Mm-hmm. And that's why I like to go to I like to go to a music festival that had all sorts of different people. Um, one band that played, and I recently saw, and I'm remembering this now because I was working at a lady's house, and they, <laughs> uh, I think, we're working like around the daughter's room, and mm -hmm. uh, she had a on her wall the Wet Secrets. Uh, the Wet Secrets is a amazing little Edmontonian band, which consists of a drummer, a keyboarder a bass player, and I think there was three brass players, and they perform rock. Okay. And uh, they do a great job. They're unbelievably good. And I really want to see them get a little bit of fame and hype because they do they do a great job, and they put on a good show. And their music actually has meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, so personally, this this whole, like, make things exactly the same as they were – 
dude, we have recorders for that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want to hear the same 30 songs that Linkin Park has put out. This is not even, it's like seven. <laughs> Let's hear My December. Uh, Nobody knows about that song Linkin Park put out. But it's a beautiful song and it's made with so much emotion. And that's actually one of the reasons, allegedly, why uh, oh. the lead singer killed himself. Oh. His fandom turned on him because he wanted to do something new and they didn't want that. Mm. And that's sad. That is I enjoyed, very sad. I enjoyed the new stuff he was putting out. I loved the uh, 10,000 Sons album, which was the first time that he got a big backlash about his music. Or 1,000 Sons, sorry. I always get that one and uh, 10,000 Fists mashed together. I kind of found them at the same time. But uh, it's a beautiful album. And compared to their music that they were doing before, I would argue that that was their first. It's it's interesting that you bring that up because I myself have my own issues with that because I program my concerts and things like that because I find things that have personal meaning to me and then I want to go out and perform them because I want my performances to have some kind of a meaning. So, you know, when I come up with a theme and I'm going to put a whole bunch of music in it that is going to be exploring that theme. And then I'll get told by other people that say, well, that was really great. You performed so well. And I'll say, yeah, it's kind of too bad. You know, the hall wasn't full or whatever. And they say, well, sure, but that's because nobody wants to hear what you performed. And I said, oh, and why not? Well, because it's not the popular stuff. It's not the stuff that everybody knows. If you go out there and you sing, you know, the Toreador, people know that. If you're going to go out there and sing the Largo from Barber of Seville, people know that. But yeah. if you go out there and if you do uh, War Stories by Ned Roram, you're going to turn off a lot of people considering that you are singing an anti-war, that you are doing like a 20-minute set that is all anti-war and is all harrowing, very unpleasant deliberately so music to listen to because it's anti-war yeah no i i see what you mean and i get it i mean why is culture so afraid of exploring new things that's, that's the real question here behind this uh this whole thing i mean like like i said this movie whiplash mm -hmm. is we're gonna get back on topic on here hey I we're talking about music it's important i don't like the movie mm -hmm. but i understand its relevance and its importance yes like i i get exactly what you see from it and like <laughs> i see you, you performing a uh, a piece mm -hmm. like war stories right if i had the money and the time i would absolutely be coming out to those because personally the way i see it is mm -hmm. the old russian expression uh from another movie that we're going to talk about eventually here uh at, actually by the director of the movie that we talk about here uh, a book read a thousand times is a thousand different books. Mm -hmm. Now, I had this big discussion with one of my friends because we were talking about video games, and I said, just watch this one game, soccer. Watch it played through. Don't worry about listening to, like, make it a no commentary. Like, don't worry about, you don't need to have somebody commentating on it. And he said, oh, well, that's limiting them, and that removes their expression about it. And I said, no, that's not the case that's at all. That's not the point like, when it comes to a game like Stalker. In, in most <laughs> games, I understand, yes, that makes sense, because the game is directly driven in one direction, and you always come out at the same end. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the case for every single AAA title. It's all aims at the exact same direction. Yeah. When they tell you that you have many different endings, it's basically just a different screenshot of what's going on with a bit of a different text. It mm -hmm. doesn't actually change anything. Yeah. Now, Stalker is not one of those games. It's dangerously close, but it is not one of those games. And, uh... I mean, even then, that sort of alternate ending thing, or, you know, the endings are kind of the same, that's only one of the branches that you can choose to end the game in the first place. Yes, and the, the endings are extremely different. Yeah. Because you have a huge false ending that has three different branches, yep. and then you get the true ending with two different branches. Mm -hmm. So and there's it, a lot of stuff that you do difference. need to do to qualify for those. And luck. Mm -hmm. Luck is involved too. Don't forget that because you can walk right past it yep. and miss it. 
but uh that's that's the thing about this kind of a game and then you know we had that discussion and it's very much the same thing yeah. uh, it all comes back to that again the whole thing of one book read a thousand times is a thousand, is a thousand different books mm-hmm. i would like to experience what war story means from you right because it means something different from you than it would from another singer from what the person has writ writ mm-hmm. themselves or uh compiled yep. the music yeah well and the other thing about it too is that my opinion on it may change and i will perform it differently because now i suddenly think hmm no i think that this particular song is talking about this instead so i'm going to approach it from that perspective and i'm going to perform it so this, this is the thing that i love about live performances is that you get to recreate something every time you're working with different people you have a different like director who has a different creative vision and you collaborate with them and you make something that is going to be different the next time you perform it now granted when you're putting on a show presumably all of those performances are going to be kind of identical they're not always going to be the same every single night, but they're going to kind of follow the same beats generally. But there will Dr. Dre. Sorry? By Dr. Dre. <laughs> no, not those types of beats. But, um, well, I don't know. I don't know if any of those guys would ever be interested in doing some kind of an opera. That would be interesting to look into, I'd there say. There are a lot of classically trained singers that end up doing a lot of uh, like genres that you wouldn't assume they would be. I mean... The lead singer to Ramstein was a classically trained singer. Same with Serge Tankian and System of a Down. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's also, of course, um, oh, dang, of course, is uh, Freddie Mercury from Queen. Absolutely. Um, what's the, what's the, what's the clown? Oh, um, Puddle's Pity Party. There we go. Oh, he's unbelievably mm-hmm. good. <laughs> and absolutely classically trained. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> I was just like going, let's go for something that's maybe Sorry, when you're saying newer. the clown, I'm thinking insane clown posse, but that they're not classically uh, trained. Well, that's, 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 that's different. Very different. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, there's something about the way Fletcher is doing everything where it's like he has his way of doing it and that's the way it's going to be done every time. And honestly, that's boring. Like, as far as live performances go, because you can record that, and you can bottle that, and you can listen to the recording. Truthfully, he's not doing it for the performances at all. Oh, well, we and know And we that. figure that out later on, because he says he's looking to make one of the greats. And ah, right. He's just using it as all a staple to shit on people and destroy them. I don't think he even cares about actually making somebody great. I think that's all just fluff that he's using to uh, try to break down the people around him and force them to do his bidding Mm -hmm. well i mean so he every time they play at a competition he's always talking about all it takes is one phone call from those people out there and you'll be at carnegie hall you'll be core in the lincoln center you'll be a blue note signee all this other stuff all that's all it takes and you know and in a way it's because it all became because you were performing under me and i'm sitting there going Mm, no. no like having connection having connections gets you a foot in the door the rest of it is all on you as a musician and even then your connections don't always mean that much because if everyone else outside of Schaefer Conservatory in terms of the film if everyone else thinks that Fletcher is a huge asshole then I mean Maybe they might think that you're talented and you are very regimented, so you've got a lot of good discipline, but they're still going to want to hear you play, and they might still just be like, no, that's not the sound we're looking for. And so then, what was the point? What what did you get after all that abuse that he put you through? So this whole thing, uh, the way it's presented, just reminds me very heavily from... Uh a scene from the the pilot episode of Venture Bros Brothers. Or the Venture Bros, <laughs> The Venture Bros. And uh, it's about uh, Dr. Venture is like berating Billy Quizboy 
because mm, they're at a convention mm-hmm. and it's about UN technologies and performing be- the betterment of society and through technology and that. Right. And uh, Dr. Venture looks over and screams at Billy. He's like, I didn't think that your diorama of where rain comes brings anything to light. Like, you know, especially after uh, Dr. Venture himself just performed a uh, display of the Ure, which he shows destroying an entire city, city and melting it into goo. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I think that, uh, I think what this is actually displaying is a grotesque system mm-hmm. where they see somebody who did do good and they're like, oh, they did great. And they used to be somebody who's really good. And we're just going to kind of like, let him come by slowly until we recognize he's actually a better person and he's doing what we would like him to do. But at the end of the day, he's just using it to shit on other people. Yeah. Because, let's be honest, all of those people that he was training, did he talked about one person who actually made it yep. and actually got signed on, and then that person ended up killing themselves? Yep. Uh, like, that's not a sign of you raising a great. Mm-hmm. That is the sign of you shitting all over people and them getting infections and then the one that happened to have a really strong immunity is the one who comes out right yeah he came out for what all of a year year and a half yeah like is that really again his his ideology of i'm pushing people to make them great is garbage it mm-hmm. doesn't work you... i've actually had a guy in refrigeration try to tell me this and my response to that is is it's wrong Mm-hmm. That's not how you do it because you end up f- screwing over the whole industry because at the end of the day, sure, you get what you want and you get somebody who's really good at this. But what does that have to show? How is that going to go on after he's he's done? You're going to have a very small group of people that can actually do these tasks and these jobs. And it's going to be anybody who even attempts to to get into it becomes resentful from it, regardless of their talent or ability. Mm -hmm. You end up not creating anything new, but continuing to do the same stuff over and over, just like these concerts. Yep. And you end up essentially poisoning your own well. Mm -hmm. There is a story that I was told when I was doing a summer program that um, the the way it happened was we were having a seminar that was all about uh, mental health and being nicer to ourselves and things like that because we're our own worst critics right and as musicians artists we are way more critical of ourselves and you know that thing that you were talking about at the um a different <laughs> video when you were talking about being nice to each other you get complimented as a performer because you did a good job and everyone's like hey i really enjoyed that but then you yourself might be like, mm, no, I could have done that better. And so maybe we don't receive the, the, the compliment the way that perhaps we should. Or we're just really caught in our own head and we're just like, I can't believe I cacked on that high note. I'd been practicing for so long and I effed it up. And now it's just horrible and everyone else is like, what the, what, what's the problem? You were out there for two hours. So what if you cacked on one note? That was phenomenal. I can't do that. You should be proud of yourself in that sort of That actually reminds me of another singer that I absolutely love. Uh, <laughs> I believe her name is LP. Just the letter L and uh-huh. P. Um, she's an amazing songwriter. She writes a lot of music for a lot of different people. Mm-hmm. And she does her own music as well. And I saw her twice. Uh, once at Sonic Boom. She was phenomenal. And then I heard that she was coming back to to folk fest and i saw her and of course the people i was going with had no idea who she was and i was like whoa you guys are in for a show because (laughs) she's an amazing performer Mm -hmm. not performer in the sense of like britney spears or uh, ramstein but a performer in the sense of she can sing she can play and she has a way of laying out a song that's just unbelievably well done Mm -hmm. and of course i feel kind of bad for her because at folk fest she actually had a cold and she was performing and she wasn't able to hit the notes that she was because of her cold. And she was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm actually a little sick. And the entire crowd just erupted in applause. And they're like, Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for even just showing up. Oh yeah, absolutely. When, when singers, 
power through. They feel like shit, but everyone else is like, I, I, can't, I, can't, even, I can't even do that when I'm not sick. And yeah. the fact that you can perform that way while you're sick, I mean, dang, you are, you are amazing and that sort of thing. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've been there and so has pretty much every other performer. They've all had to do something like that before. Um, but uh, so basically the thing that I was told had to do with setting your career aspirations. So again, with this whole Neiman wants to be one of the greats or the next great or whatever. And Fletcher wants to find the next great in his own uh, way. <laughs> and so this person uh, was the leading the seminar, she talked about how she had a colleague who also just wanted to be at the top. She was, she wanted to be like the peak of her voice type. Um, and so she finally got to perform at the Met in New York City. And for a lot of opera singers, that is kind of a, a pinnacle of your career if you get to be at the Met. Um, and so she went there and she performed and it was lights out, you know, I got a standing ovation and everything, everyone throwing flowers and all that. Everyone that was in the wings was applauding her too. And then the curtain comes down and she's just distraught. She's crying. She's like absolutely upset. And everyone's like, what's wrong? Why are you so upset? That was an amazing performance. And she said, yeah, but I'm still not going to be, I'm still not the next Rene Fleming. I'm not one of the greats. I, I gave up everything so that I could get here. And this is all I have. You know, I'm 38 years old. I, I don't have a, I don't have a husband. I don't have kids. I put everything aside for my career and this is all I have to show for it. And so basically the moral that the person giving the seminar was saying, know what you want, understand kind of what you're sacrificing and make sure that you are okay with that before you go ahead with it, because then you might end up like that person. And even though you accomplish something, now you feel that you, it, it rings so hollow. The Bojack issue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like there might be some other things that might have also been going on with her. I mean, probably. I sit you here. You never know the whole story, right? Exactly, exactly. And and I mean, the, uh, the entire point for her was for us to talk about understand that you don't. The other part, too, was saying, understand that you don't have to give up everything if that's what you want. It's kind of like the antithesis of what he did to Nicole in the movie because he's like oh you know I'm just going to continue doing music and you're going to want to demand more time for me and all this other stupid crap and and I sat there the first time I watched this movie I was like man you suck like sure I have not wanted to get into relationships or not thought about having relationships because I keep talking about how I want to move to a different country and most people probably aren't on board with that. And to which I'd say, you're right. So I don't want to get into a situation where suddenly it's like, this is really unfair of me to try to force this issue on you. And I'm aware of that. Whereas he just, he has confidence. He wants a girlfriend. He goes and he has a girlfriend and then he decides to act that way. Yeah. But again, that's the toxicity from uh, yeah from Fletcher. Yeah, yeah. There's that too. Um, so we should probably wrap this up. So yeah, we're we're kicking an hour and a half <laughs> at least here. <laughs> so the film ends with him kind of having a showdown with Fletcher. Would you call this a happy ending? Because personally, I don't think it's a victory. Or I maybe would see it as kind of more of a Pyrrhic victory on uh, Neiman's part. I mean, I'm not saying Fletcher necessarily won either, but I don't necessarily, I don't see this as a happy conclusion. Are you kidding me? This is the perfect happy ending. Both sides win. Well, how would because you... Because Fletcher actually gets to push somebody to the point where, like, they're breaking down. Mm. And uh, the guy's, like trying to become the greatest and he's like standing up for himself honestly though like all joking aside uh no the ending was shit because at the end of the day uh newman 
Newman gave in. Newman gave in to, to Fletcher, which means oh. Fletcher is going to continue his pattern. He's going to destroy other people. Yeah. And at the end of the day, Newman probably is going to kill himself because he'll never be good enough because Fletcher is going to keep shitting on him uh, to be the best. And as when Newman dies, or if he carries on and then dies, mm-hmm. uh, Fletcher's going to find somebody else to, to mess around with. Right. Again, this is not about Fletcher wanting to have a person who is the greatest. Mm-hmm. He wants to be in a position of power and abuse it. Yes. I mean, because he got turfed from Schaefer, but there he was leading another band of young, impressionable musicians. Yep. He's still... He just got to go from one to another. Um, I mean, I don't know. Perhaps there might be something to this about the fact that this takes place in 2014, and then Me Too began in 2017, 2018, and therefore a fair number of people were just kind of getting removed and just being like, nope, nope, we, uh, nope, we don't need that bad press and things like that, so you can kindly fuck off. And then if they try to go to other places, they might be like, mm, no, no, we're, we know what you're bringing and we don't want that. So and that maybe be how it might is. be a little bit different now, but it, I, I don't know. Like, I, like, I, question, like I was telling you. My question is for how long? Exactly. Exactly. That, that was where I was going with that. Yeah. Um, well, so, I mean, when I say happy ending, A lot of people that I know who, okay, maybe not a lot of people, but a decent amount of people liked the ending and they thought that Neiman was victorious because he has this nice kind of breakthrough moment where he's having that drum solo that goes on for way too goddamn long. And, you know, he mutinies against Fletcher because he cuts him off while he's introducing the next piece and all that other stuff. So he's fighting back against him. So he's winning. But sure, maybe it's a personal victory to himself. But as far as I'm concerned, like as a musician, he's he's kind of screwed himself over. He has opened himself up to be labeled as like a prima Difficult. donna. And yeah, Difficult, yeah. So, and people aren't going to want to work with him. Again, yes. And the reason why he is how he is is, is because, because of Fletcher. Fletcher. So he fucked himself over and he let Fletcher win, even though he didn't actually win. Yep. And this is basically how Stockholm Syndrome works. Like, let's talk about Stockholm Syndrome in New York City. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, this is, uh, no, I would say he did not win. I don't think that was a good, happy ending. <laughs> uh, I think it just shows that it just continues the cycle of abuse. And sure, it leaves on a high note, but that high note is falsified. So I don't think I have said it at all during this review or whatever we want to refer to it as, but this ending, this is, this is what made me love the movie, actually, believe it or not. I like the straight story. Yes. Well, just, just the conclusion of it, it all culminating in basically that final, you know, drum solo by him. I'm sitting there and I'm just like, You have fucked yourself over and you are now a lost cause as far as like a performing musician goes. I've heard some other people say to me, he's a drummer. He can still get work. And I said, oh, sure, he can still get work. Sort of like how Fletcher can still go to uh, uh, a divey jazz club or whatever and play the piano or whatever. Sure. But he's not going to the Lincoln Center. He's probably not going to get signed by blue note or any other like big label or anything like that because he's difficult and they can go and they can find any other drummer that is not difficult and in a way that is that is one of the things that was hammered into me in my education was be nice be professional be a good colleague and you can be a middling performer at best but you will go far because people will want to work with you Because you're not an asshole. That's true. But that does also make me ask this question. What's to say that the industry isn't just all Fletchers? Like, how do you know that the industry isn't all Fletchers? And the reason why they want you to be somebody who is flexible and easy to work with is because that way you are just an easier cog in their machine. And you will do as they say. 
Well, considering that a lot of the people that I'm really good friends with, we have all performed with the same directors and we have worked with the same people. And the fact that we all have like the same stories about some people that are are, are either out of the industry or do not have a lot of pull, as opposed to the people that we do have good things to say about are people that can always get hired to direct another show with uh, a a more prestigious or more well-known company, I think that speaks more to it. Uh, I understand what you're saying. But (laughs) I do. But what if... What if out of this sewer in your world is just another sewer for a larger uh, community? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'm not saying that's not also possible. I mean... Some people that I have spoken to, when they talk about who they have worked with in the past, but then they're telling me stories from performances that they did back when I would have been, like, a baby. And I sit there and I go, it's 30 years. Some things have changed. You know, in my master's degree, um, we ended up getting one of our, one of the director's put under like academic probation or like he was under investigation because he's older he's in his 60s and he was making comments that uh some of the women in the show took uh, offense to and they reported him and then there was an investigation and he he didn't like get fired or anything like that but basically this would have been in my first year and so then in the second year when he was still directing a show and so and he also was kind of running like the opera class as it were and so he said okay everyone so i need to lay out some ground rules these are how you know you will refer to me as this title or that title uh you we will not be on personal terms or anything like that. And that does go for those of you that are in my studio that are here as well. You know, here we're going to be very professional and everything like that. And since I, I had a relationship with him outside of the, the university, I remember talking about it with him at his house and he was just like, yeah, a bunch of people, you know, went and said that, oh, you're not allowed to say these things anymore. Well, how was I supposed to know? And I, so I was just kind of like, well, me and a few other people that were also at the house were like, well, you know now, don't you? So you learned your lesson, didn't you? You're not going to do that anymore, right? And he's yeah. like, okay, fine, fine. And we're like, good. <laughs> we're glad that you learned the lesson. <laughs> Again, you. This is something I said to you, uh, not on script, but like, you can't just be a stick. You yeah. have to have a carrot too. Yes, I. Uh, yes. To deny one or the other means that you are not giving the right. Uh, you're not motivating properly. Right. Everything needs to be in balance. Yes. Yeah. And as a conservationist, I understand this. Yeah. Well, I think that about does it for this. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I think that was really good. It was, I learned things that I did not know that I was going to learn about you, Miles. (laughs) Yeah, I surprise people every now and then. (laughs) It's always a pleasure when that happens. Well, (laughs) we'll see everyone next time. See ya.